Hey guys, Mr. Backerberg here. In this video, we're going to look at inverse relations and inverse functions. So first, let's define what an inverse relation is. So the ordered pair AB is in a relation if and only if the ordered pair BA is in the inverse relation. So notice it's the same exact values, they're just flipped around. So for example, if the ordered pair 1, 3 was in our relation, then we should be able to flip-flop the ordered pair to make it 3, 1, and that should be in the inverse relation. Now we're going to focus on functions here, so if we look at the graph of the function f of x equals x squared, we get this parabola graph, and I've got some points highlighted on it. So here we've got a point at the origin, which is 0, 0, then we've got a point at 1, 1, and then we've got a point at 2, 4, and then on the left hand side we've got a point at negative 1, 1, and also at negative 2, 4. But if we think about an inverse relation for this function, what we would do is flip-flop the ordered pairs for each one of those points. So instead of the point 2, 4, it would be the point 4, 2. Okay, so when we do that, we end up getting a picture that looks something like this. So 0, 0 stays at 0, 0, because when you reverse the order on those x's and y's, it stays the same. Same thing with 1, 1. But like we said about that 2, 4, that's going to go out to the point 4, 2. On the left-hand side, the negative 1, 1 point is going to go to 1, negative 1 and the negative 2, 4 point is going to go to 4, negative 2. So now as we look at this picture, we can see that this definitely doesn't pass the vertical line test. So this inverse isn't actually a function. But there is actually a test that we can run by looking at our original graph for our function to determine if this inverse is going to be a function or not. Now we're used to using the vertical line test to check if something is a function, but if we want to see if something's inverse is a function, we use the horizontal line test. So here if I draw in a horizontal line through my parabola, I can see that we're intersecting that graph at more than one point. So what that's going to mean is that this inverse is not going to be a function. Because if we think about taking all of these ordered pairs and switching them around, this horizontal line, when we switch it, would turn into a vertical line, which this graph does not pass the vertical line test. So we're going to look at a few graphs here, and we're going to look at using both our vertical and our horizontal line test. So the first thing we want to look at is, does the graph represent a function? So that's when we use the vertical line test. So as we look at this picture right here, we would draw in vertical lines to decide yes or no, is this one a function? And what we're looking for is, does a vertical line intersect more than one point on the graph? And anywhere we draw in a vertical line on this graph, it will never touch more than one point. So yes, this one is a function. The next thing we want to look at is, does the inverse represent a function? So here's where we look at doing the horizontal line test. So if we were to look at our picture and draw in a bunch of horizontal lines, again, we're looking to see, do any of those horizontal lines intersect our graph at more than one point? And the answer is, no, they don't. So yes, the inverse is also a function. Now notice I've changed the picture, but we're doing the same exact thing. We want to first check to see does the graph represent a function. So we're looking at using our vertical line test. And if I draw in a vertical line right here, I can see that that vertical line is intersecting at more than one point. So no, this one is not a function. But now if we found an inverse, would it be a function? So we're looking at using the horizontal line test. And as we're looking at our picture, if I draw in any horizontal lines, those lines will never intersect our graph at more than one place. So yes, this inverse would be a function. Now I've changed the picture again. We're first going to look to see does the graph represent a function. So that's our vertical line test. And if I draw in a vertical line, I can see that I'm intersecting at more than one point. So no, this one is not a function. And then if we check if the inverse is a function, I would draw in a horizontal line. And I can see that my horizontal line would intersect at more than one point as well. So no, the inverse of this is not a function either.
Last picture we're going to take a look at. Again, we want to check to see does this graph represent a function. So we're thinking about our vertical line test. So if we draw in any vertical line, are we going to intersect at more than one point? Now there's actually asymptotes happening in here to separate the pieces of our graph out. So because of those asymptotes, then yes, this one will be a function. But if we look at is the inverse a function, if we draw in a horizontal line, we can see that a horizontal line would intersect at more than one point. So the inverse is not a function. So as far as an inverse function, if f is a one-to-one -one function, meaning that it passes the horizontal line test with a domain of d and a range of r, then the inverse function, which is denoted with an f with a little negative one power on it, that's the function with domain r and range d, and it's defined as the inverse of f of b is equal to a if and only if f of a is b. Now notice with this that the domain and range values are interchanging places. We started with a domain of D and a range of R, but then those changed to a domain of R and a range of D. So we're going to look at how we find inverse functions algebraically. The first thing we want to do is look at our original function f and we want to determine if there's going to be an inverse function by checking to see that f is one to one, meaning that we're going to run the horizontal line test. Now, if there is an inverse, if our graph passes the horizontal line test, we'll continue working. But if it doesn't, then we can just stop because the inverse doesn't exist. Now, anytime we're working with a function f, it's always important to keep in mind the domain of f. So we also want to state any restrictions that there might be on the domain of our function. Now the second step, what we're going to do is we're going to take our equation and we are going to switch around the x and the y in the equation. And then step three, we're going to solve to get y alone. And then when we do that, the answer we get is actually going to be the inverse of our original function f. And again, anytime we're dealing with a function, we want to state if there are any restrictions on the domain of our function or of the inverse function. So we're going to go ahead and look at finding an inverse function algebraically. So we're going to look at the function f of x equals x over x plus 1. And the first thing I want to do with this is graph it out to make sure that it does pass the horizontal line test before we keep moving. So in my calculator and my y equals screen, I already have my function typed in x over x plus 1. When I hit graph, I get a picture that looks something like this. So I'm going to go ahead and say, yes, this one does pass the horizontal line test. So now we're going to keep working. We also said that we want to state the domain for our function. So if we look at the denominator, we don't want the denominator to be 0. So here, negative 1 would be a bad value to plug in for x. So I'm going to say that x cannot be negative 1. Now remember, this function notation, this f of x on the left-hand side, really means y equals, so we have y equals x over x plus 1. Step number 2 said that we want to switch around the x's and the y's. So now this is going to say x equals y over y plus 1. And our goal is going to be to solve to get y alone. So the first thing I want to do is get rid of this fraction by multiplying that y plus 1 over to the other side. Now I'm going to distribute the x on the left hand side. So when I take x times y, I just get xy. And when I take x times 1, I just get plus x. And this is equal to y. Now right now I have multiple y's showing up in my equation. So I want to get everything with a y in it on one side. So I'm going to subtract this xy over to the other side. So now we're going to get x equals y minus xy. And to take these two y's and combine them, what I'm actually going to do is factor a y out of the right-hand side. So then in the front, I'm just going to have 1 left over, minus on the back end, it'll just be the x left over. And then to get y alone, I'm going to need to take this 1 minus x and divide it over to the other side. So then I get the equation y equals x over 1 minus x. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of the y that's in here and replace it with my inverse function notation. So f with a negative 1 power on it, that means the inverse of f. So the inverse of f is going to be x over 1 minus x. 
and now we want to look at this function and state any restrictions on its domain. Here, since we don't want to have zero on the bottom of the fraction, one would be a bad number to plug in. So we don't want x to be one. Now we're going to look at something called the inverse reflection principle, and this is going to help us look at inverse functions graphically. So the points AB and BA in the coordinate plane are symmetric with respect to the line y equals x, which means that they are reflections of each other across the line y equals x. And earlier on, we talked about a relationship between inverses as far as their ordered pairs with the ordered pairs being flipped around. So that's actually how this inverse reflection principle is going to come into play when we start graphing things out and trying to find inverses graphically. So to look at inverses graphically, I want to look at the function f of x equals x cubed. And when we graph that out, we'd get a picture that looks something like this. And I'm going to highlight some of those ordered pairs. So we have a point at 0, 0. We've got a point at 1, 1. This point is at 2, 8. And on the left-hand side, we've got a point at negative 1, negative 1, and also at negative 2, negative 8. And what we just said is graphically, we should be able to flip-flop the order on these x and y ordered pairs, and that'll give us the graph for the inverse. So if we take and flip-flop all of those ordered pairs, we're going to get a picture that looks something like this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this picture and I'm going to slide it over top of my original picture. And I've also added in a line in there for y equals x. We can see that these ordered pairs are being mirrored over top of that line. So the inverse graph is our original graph of f just reflected across this y equals x line. Now when we're looking at inverse functions algebraically, there is something called the inverse composition rule that we can use to check if two functions are inverses of each other. So the inverse composition rule says a function f is one to one with inverse g if and only if when you do the composition in both orders, so f composed with g and g composed with f, you should get just a plain x as your answer. So we're going to look at a couple of functions and we're going to verify that they are inverses of each other. So my f of x function is going to be x cubed plus 1. And my g of x function is going to be the cube root of x minus 1. And we're going to do function composition and we're going to do it in both directions. We're going to do f composed with g and g composed with f. And hopefully we get x as the answer at the end for both of them. So I'm going to start by doing f composed with g of x, meaning that I'm going to take my g of x function and I'm going to plug it in for x in my f function. So right here where my x is, I'm going to plug in the cube root of x minus 1, and then I have to cube that, and then I add 1 onto the end. So here the cubed and the cubed root are going to cancel each other out. So then we just have x minus 1 plus 1 and the minus one and the plus one will cancel each other out, so then we just get x. But we should also check this in the other direction as well, so doing g of f of x. So when we do that, we're gonna take our f function and plug it into our g function. So we have this big long cube root, and underneath it we've got our x, so I need to plug in my x cubed plus one, and then I'm going to subtract one from that. Now, underneath the cube root, the plus 1 and the minus 1 are going to cancel each other out. And then it's the cube root of x cubed. And again, the cube root and the cubed are going to cancel each other out. So we just get x left over. So because we get x when we do both versions of the composition, then we can say that f and g are in fact inverses of each other. We're going to look at another example where we find an inverse function algebraically. So we're going to look at f of x equals the square root of x plus 3. And the first thing we should do is graph this out to make sure that it is 1 to 1 so that it passes the horizontal line test. 
So I've already got my function typed into my y equals screen. When I hit graph, we can see that this will pass the horizontal line test. So we're going to keep going with finding the inverse. Now, anytime we're talking about a function, we are going to talk about the restrictions on the domain of the function. So looking at this one, we need to make sure that the stuff underneath the radical isn't negative. So the x values in here are going to need to be greater than or equal to negative 3. But I also want to talk about the range of this function. So I'm going to look back at the graph real quick. Remember, the range refers to the y value. So as we're looking here, this graph never drops below 0. So we can say that the range of this function is y values that are greater than or equal to 0. Now as we look at building the inverse function, now remember this f of x just means y equals, so we get the equation y equals the square root of x plus 3, but then we want to flip flop our x and our y, so we're going to get x equals the square root of y plus 3. Now our goal is to solve to get y alone, and right now y is trapped underneath the radical, so we're going to need to square both sides in order to get rid of that. So we've got x squared equals y plus 3. And then I'm going to subtract the 3 from the left-hand side. So we're going to get the equation y equals x squared minus 3. Now, it doesn't look like there's going to be any domain restrictions on this one because there are no fractions, so we don't have to worry about dividing by 0. And there are no radicals, so we don't have to worry about square rooting negative numbers. But our original function did have some restrictions on both the domain and the range. And those are going to affect our function over here. As we look back, for the domain, we had x values that were greater than or equal to negative 3, and we had y values that were greater than or equal to 0. Well, in this step right here for building the inverse function, we exchanged the x and the y values. So I'm actually going to look at my domain and range right here, and I'm going to exchange the x and the y values. So that's going to leave me with y values that are greater than or equal to negative 3 and x values that are greater than or equal to 0. So this is actually going to tell me what my domain and my range of my new function needs to be. Because we've got x values that are greater than or equal to 0, that needs to be the domain for this function. And our y values that are greater than or equal to negative 3, that's going to be the range of our function. That's going to be it for this video. Thanks for watching.